Okay. Seems to be on. Is that possible? Perfect. Perfect. Um, gentlemen, can you blow something from there? Uh, can you blow? I just want to check something. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting the next two, three minutes now. Yeah, thank you. and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, today was so emotional for me walking in, in this building. I haven't been to the Morris Isaacson in quite a, a while. And looking at the school, sure, a lot of emotions started running. Um, thank you so much for, for coming. I, um, I hope you will feel welcome. And thank you so much to Ukubu for playing such beautiful music. Drums are, are something that's very good for black people. Most of us uh, re react beautifully to it. Um, I would like to say good morning to everyone. And thank you so much for taking your time to come here and spend the day with us. And welcome to the Tieti Mashinini annual it's the 20, 2022, um, it's the seventh annual memorial. Thank you so much for coming and welcome. Uh, 
Um, in, in our midst, we have U Ishmael, who was the student at the Morris Isaacson. He's our alumni, he's a musician. He plays such beautiful music. He's going to play the national anthem for us. Can we kindly stand up so that we can all respect and sing the national anthem? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ishmael. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to our seventh annual Tietimashilini Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much for coming again. We appreciate it, and the music was beautiful. Um, we would like to call um, a student who was a student in the 70s. His name is um, Pastor Silo Mokoka. He was a soccer star at Morris Isaacson in the 70s. He's going to give us a prayer today. He's now a pastor. Can you kindly come, pastor? Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, uh, this is program director and distinguished guest and our guest speaker and the family of Mr. Machine. Thank you. Yes, give me to one as you, uh, you know, when I came in here, you know, there was that emotional thing that hits me in my heart. And I think also some of the, our brothers and sisters who were with us during those times, kind of really, it brought memories. Shall we all stand and request our sister, who usually, kind of really, Arbina Nadipina, Kasafila Pilar and Katapelo. Thank you.
Let us pray. God Almighty God, all powerful, all knowing, all seeing. We kneel before you, merciful loving God. We bow our heads at the throne of your heavenly kingdom. Oh Lord, we plead with you and ask you to give us a vision and leadership that will steer us through these turbulent waters, COVID-19, killings, world conflicts, and wars. We pray that everything we do, our actions must reflect your love that resides in our hearts. You establish the order that governs us, hear our prayers and give us peace in our time that we may rejoice in thy mercy and praise you without end. Today, as we get a chair to commemorate the seventh memorial lecture of the late C.H.C. MacDonald Machinini, who, like your righteous servant Moses of the biblical times, C.H.C. led the student of this school, Morris Isaacson High School, to take to the streets to unchain themselves from the barbaric system of Bantu education and to seek a better quality education for all black children of South Africa. God and me God, as we remember him, we too also remember those teachers who defied the apartheid system and laid down their lives to teach us to become who we are today. Father God, hear our prayers of the families gathered here before you in mercy and love, unite all your children wherever they may be. Welcome into your kingdom, our departed brothers and sisters, and all who have left this world. Remember, O oh Lord, those who have died in peace of Christ and all the dead whose faith is known to you alone. There we hope to share your glory when every tear will be wiped away. We remember what dearly departed from this world. We remember Principal Khaumatawate, Deputy Principal Mlokoti, Ntate Komkom, Ntate Lekheto Senior, Ntate Nomen Malabane, Ntate Piche, Memerim Kadana, Memacho, Tate Khaise, Ms. Kosana, Mrs. and Ms. Keza Havi, Mrs. Musala, Abraham Kubutitiro, Mr. Maboya, Mr. Mrs. Mutumi, Tate Mulope, Mr. Mnube, Tate Musue, and Mr. Matala, and many others who have, whom we have called upon to your heavenly kingdom. Lord God our Father, we humbly ask you to bless everyone in this hall. Bless our brothers and sisters and our Lena students, Putanang Youth Trust, our distinguished guest speaker, Mr. Dr. K.S. Marohanya, and the family of City Machinin. We ask all this to Christ, your son, who lives and reigns in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father. Amen. from the class of 76. Um, welcome to our guests, and thank you very much for, for coming. Um, matriculants are 17 and 18. When I think of me when I was 18, I was pregnant. 
I was a statistic. And it's not a nice feeling. I always say when I see teenage pregnancies, I don't think they understand Oguti, how difficult it is being pregnant as a teenager. They think it's cool. It's actually a challenge. I almost went through a, I went through a big breakdown. Things were so bad for me. But thanks to my mom, she supported me. I went back to school and everything is history. And I work hard and I've since forgiven myself. In my list, there is Uluyanga Smelane, who's a grade 12 student at Morris Isaacson High School. Um, can we please welcome her on stage? Greetings to the house at large. My name is Leander Similane, the president of Morris Isaacson High School's class representative leadership. I would like to thank the program director, thank the principal along with the staff and the learners, the Morris Isaacson High School alumni, the Machinini family, our keynote speaker, Dr. Mar Maruhani, those who are tuning in, all youth of our country, and all viewers nationally and globally. It's an honor to welcome you all to Morris Isaacson High School. On this day, On this day, let us celebrate and acknowledge the lives of the freedom fighters and become one in fighting for the sustainability of the freedom that was fought for. With that being said, I thank you all. Thank you, Leander. Um, being young is something so amazing. And I hope our young kids um, know and understand that it's actually a good thing. And the boys must be as responsible as the girls are always forced to be. What does it mean to be a good leader? To move in a direction that inspire others to make a change Today we honor our 1976 youth leader, Utsi Yeti and all the 1976 youth that were young then. <laughs> Thank you, I know you are. Utsi Yeti and his brave efforts in standing up for black people in a system that put them at a disadvantage. Not only language barriers, but unemployment and access to basic and decent living conditions. Let's welcome our youth leader from CWJ, Utato Sidibe. Ladies and gentlemen, so the current students of Marissa Isaacson, the Morissa Isaacson alumni, the Machinini family, and to our keynote speaker, Mr. Marohage, and to our viewers at home, greetings to you all. My name is Tato Sidibe, and I'm part of a statistic. Which statistic, you may ask? Well, I'm part of the 63.9% of the youth who are currently unemployed, and believe me, that's not a statistic I'm proud to be a part of. Like every young person, I wish to contribute towards groceries. I wish to take my parents out to a restaurant once in a while. I wish I could buy myself a few things without hearing But most importantly, I wish to be independent. According to stats to say, 60% of the youth ex experience depression right after the matric year. And the common reason for this rapidly increasing number is the question, 
what do I do now? Reality gave me a huge slap across my face after I had completed my matric here, and I thought to myself, I'll just go study for a few years, and then I'll be successful. So I went to go further my studies with expectations that when I'm done, I'll get the job I want, and then I'll be successful. But no one had prepared me for the challenges which lied ahead. We only witness our mental success after they've achieved, and not while they're in the process of achieving. Hence, we think that it's all easy. Now, it's no secret that the depression we face as the youth stems from unemployment and hopelessness. And as much as we can point fingers at institutions, the big question is, what are you doing about it? How are you en enhancing your skills to become a person to make a living? What knowledge are you equipping yourself with to become a better person? And are you networking with the right people? Now, my father always used to tell me that position yourself so that when the opportunity comes, it gets you ready. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us to acknowledge the premises that we are gathered in today. These are the grounds that leaders like Tieti Mashinini and his peers risked and laid down their lives for a better tomorrow for us all. Now I urge all my peers to take the same strength, the same courage, and channel it through entrepreneurship. Because 45 years later, our enemies won unemployment. The same, the same way the students of 76 picked up stones and rocks, let it be the same way we pick up entrepreneurship to fight off unemployment. Now I'd like us to take this opportunity to commend the Fiber Initiative in our township which saw a gap and rendered their services in an exchange for a sustainable income. That's entrepreneurship. And going back to my father, I used to ask them, how are you able to sustain yourself when you haven't worked for 10 years? And he'd say, as humans, we need to coexist. One man's inconvenience is another man's gain. And I didn't understand this until one of his friends needed a minor car service and because my father had equipped himself with the skin of fixing cars, he assisted him in an exchange for money. That's entrepreneurship. So whether it's a car, it's a car wash, a puzzle shop, or whatever business you want to venture into, I'd urge you to do it, provided that it's legitimate and lawful. Now in closing, I'd like to commemorate the heroes and sheroes who came before us and who have now passed on the baton. May we keep running with it further and may we keep making them proud. Long live the spirit of Tietze Machinini, long live. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, young man. Um, you know, Something that we have in common with the young and the old and the aged and the ones who still think they're younger, like me, uh, is depression. Um, the pressure that we put on our kids, because everyone wants their children to be a doctor or a lawyer, and we forget to go to their other industries as an eco-academic. We have the entertainment industry, even though I say if you're in the entertainment industry, you must also have two diplomas. You must be in entertainment and study for something else because it's, that's where depression lives. It's a dream job, but it's challenging. And thank you so much for reminding us that we should support you. I would like to acknowledge Untlan Lux, who, who is here in the room, in the midst with us. Uh, welcome, uh, you are welcome. <laughs> We have Upusele Tolifakane, who is a representative from Putanang Youth Trust, an NGO that has supported the Tiet Machinini. Uh, I can't believe that they've been with them for seven years. When they started, they had nothing. The Putanang Youth Trust was there for the organization that organizes the Tiet Machinini Lecture. Uh, can we please welcome Ipuselito Lefakane? Thank 
to the MC, Honorable Guest Speaker, Dr. Maro Khanye, the Machine family, Morris Isaacson High School principal, teachers, learners, ladies and gentlemen, viewers at home, on all supporting media, Dumelang. My name is Puseleto Lefagani, a young female leader from Central Western Jababu. I am thrilled that Putanang Youth Trust has chosen me to represent them today. This is an organization that was established in Jababu Soweto by individuals who saw it fit to establish an organization that will empower, uplift, inspire the youth and the community of Central Western Jababu. This is through programs and initiative that addresses social economic challenges in and around the township. It was in 2019 when I got introduced to Putanang Youth Trust, I came in seeking for funding to pursue a dream that I had of attending a, Uni a United Nations conference in Malaysia, Asia. My request for assistance was received without hesitation. Not only did they assist with funding, but they went beyond to empower me with their progressive programs and initiatives that truly uplifted me to the young woman that I am today from Central Western Jababu. Ever since that day, Ever since that day, I have been a part of the Putanang Youth Trust family. The young woman standing before you today is part of a product of an organization that is dedicated to eradicating, to eradicating the vicious cycle of poverty, unemployment, hopelessness, and mental issues. I therefore hope young people in Jababu and its surrounding areas know more about this capacity building organization that is prepared to go to the ends of the world in helping the community. Putanang Youth Trust aim and vision is to achieve a working community and especially the youth through education by, de by developing programs such as school support aid that has assisted more than 30 students to further their studies. In sports, Putanang Youth Trust has assisted over 80 children in and around Jababu to make sure they attend and play the, N the Junior NBA Basketball League, thus nurture their talents through sports. Putanang also establishes and supports SMEs through making sure that 30 households with a total of 88 learners and students are a part of a program that will afford them an opportunity to study at home and attend business and career courses online through the Wi-Fi network rollout of zero-rated content for reaching households and the community with information that is now accessible to all. Putanang also supports and hosts community upliftment programs such as raising awareness on health and substance abuse. Putanang, it is a suitor word that it is a suitor word that means stand up and be in control of your destiny. Putanang Youth Trust strongly believes in the spirit of plowing back into communities, schools, local businesses and has been a staunch supporter of the annual Theatre Machinery Lecture. Because they saw it fit and a good initiative to make sure that the memory and the name of Theatre Tebucho Donald Machinini are alive. This hero of ours, also from Central Western Jababu, was a student who, do, who together with his peers rose above all odds in 1976 to stand up and make a change. This is something that Putanang believes in, standing up and being in control of your destiny. In closing, May we, the youth of today, stand up together. Sechaba Sarantu, Hari Putanang. Putanang, I thank you. Wow. Putanang does amazing work, and we appreciate it. Nessie, thank you so much. Um, it feels so, so formal. I wish. <laughs> We could start like a song. I wish we could just start a song just to make things lighter. Uh, can I ask the 1976 team to start like a song for us? No, come on, go, man.
Um, our next act uh, is a poet, Ifalisa Mukali, a young lady included in the arts industry. Welcome. Let's help welcome. Hello. Hi. My name is Unemployment. I'm also known as Worklessness, Umashalela, Joblessness, Lazy Bone, Levela, just to name a few. Some of you may perceive me as some cheetah mokoning from morning to 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 late night to mama with no plan, no swag, and no hustle. Statistically, my ratings increase over time, and lately I've been maintaining my dismal ascent, climbing the ladder to the wall of fame. Check the voting polls. Over 35.3% of people are my friends. Amongst those, 34.1% is South Africa's dearest youth. Hey, they all can vouch for me. Yep, <laughs> I'm pretty popular. Some of you have had a privilege to meet me right after being legalized. I get that the age no longer conform to parental guidance restrictions. And I like my tree, employment. There's no day I'd ask you for your CV, let alone make you queue up for my attention. I am in attention. Whether you lazy around or you toil, I understand. I understand everyone's struggle. I accommodate everyone's hustle. I don't judge. But y'all, y'all judge me, right? How mighty thou art. You prey of the web makers, makers of the monetary puzzle makers of the learning jungle, creators of confusion that infuses an illusion striped by hope whilst it shatters lives and livelihoods. And then, the puppets, products of the system, they sit high on the, on the governing throne whilst casting chains that compound a grand scale of corruption, looting the funds an act that is stripping the dignity of what's left of our economy. The rich get richer, whilst the poor get poorer. <laughs> yeah, what a time to introduce myself, right? I mean, the world is facing its worst nightmare, and it seems like I'm parading and boastfully letting people feel my presence. The deceit is that you think I'm a fraudulent achievement. I do not condone theft, let alone dance at your dismay. But hey, 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 I mean, I've been accused of making people feel depressed, of inflicting a certain amount of agony. I'm a get it, I get it, I'm meddling. But the worst I've done <laughs> is to pick at a few pockets whilst exposing how terrible your skill is at Monopoly. Now, let's be serious. Are you all serious? This has been a public service announcement from unemployment. I'm Palisa Mohari. Thank you. Mm. No, Talisa. We don't judge you, Sissy. Just that sometimes as parents we are frustrated and we want to push you so that you achieve. God, we love our children and we love and support you at all times. The only point I know, Nina, Umzwa Kimbule. So when I see young women doing it, I can see Guti Uti Eti Mashinini. They got to learn. I 
I would like to um, I would like to acknowledge a few people who are in the room. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Kabela is a colleague of Tieti Machine. The only female Waibu SSRC. She delivered the inaugural lecture with Dr. Mampela Rampela. Welcome. And I would like to acknowledge Usis Pel Lutuli as well. You are welcome. Um, Amanda. Ooh, there's so many acknowledgements. It's amazing. It, it seems like this year is, is really, really, really amazing. Thank you so much to the alumni who organized this. Um, because it seems like it's a culture. Most of us were affected in 1976. I think I was in primary school. I might not remember the grade. It was very difficult. It's We were young. We were locked in classes. I guess Ukokwam came, picked us up. We were crying the whole way. We didn't know what was going on. Little did we know we'd see the country would change. And I always remember those things, the um, slimaza, most of us, salimala, mentally. Um, every time I, I, I see these young kids, be puzujua along 1916, I'm very angry, and they say, Sis Bomi, you, you are overreactive. But they don't understand the trauma that went with it. I would like to call a community leader, Ulerato Sibuka, from Central Western Jabavu. Can you help me welcome her? Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, the keynote speaker, Dr. Marukhanya, the Mashinini family, the Morris Isaacson alumni. I'm sorry. Can I start over? <laughs> Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, the keynote speaker, Dr. Marukhanya, the Mashinini family, the Morris Isaacson alumni, the students of today, the staff, as well as the viewers at home. My name is Lerato Subuka, a young woman born and bred in Central Western Jabavu, whose father was also a student in this very school. My experience with mental health and unemployment began in 2014. After graduating, I spent almost two years unemployed and actively looking for a job. Although I had all my safety needs met, it was still a very challenging time for my mental health. The core belief that put me in a depressive state was that I was a burden to my family and myself, having no luck getting an interview, and yet I have a qualification. Now, I'm quite sure that all my peers here will agree with me that the process of applying for jobs can be daunting and demanding, especially for searching in a dense employment market. And without formal work experience, this process can feel like a personal attack with all those barriers to entry and high standards to meet. Eventually, I got a job at a bank and I was relieved. You know, although I was happy to have an income, the high pressure environment constantly had me feeling unsettled and I knew that I could not be there for long. So I enrolled to study part-time psychology and I made the necessary changes to attend classes after work. Exactly a month before the pandemic hit, I resigned from my job to focus full-time on my studies and dive deeper into the parts of myself that always felt anxious, unfulfilled, and exhausted. It felt like the right time to do that, 
because the world as we knew it had come to an end and would change forever, and so would I. My whole worldview shifted, which opened me up to the truth about purpose, both on an individual and a collective level. I found that our primary function as human beings is to create, and we are constantly creating whether we know it or not. Also, the challenges that we face around mental health today as the youth are barely individual problems, but are a combination of internal and external factors. Therefore, it is our communal responsibility as a society to create an environment that develops bright ideas and workable solutions. This is a special time where many things cannot go back to the way they used to be, which means that it is an opportunity for us to change the narrative and work together to change our mentality and free ourselves economically in this lifetime. Because we have the ability to perceive it in our minds, we know that we can achieve it. Let us set a foundation for a future that we all want. And as a remembrance of those who came before us, may this lecture be a turning point for us young people to take initiative and stand up against poverty, unemployment, or social ills, and be victorious like the leaders of 1976. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my heart is heavy. Um, as a parent, when you listen to young women um, talk about such heavy stuff, <sighs> I don't want to be emotional, Dr. Marokhan. Mental illness is a, is a serious problem. I, I was talking to you uh, before we started. And as black people, Maukuluma and your mental health, people think we are shy. Um, we harbor things. I, I dealt with mine four years ago. Four years ago, I lost weight around people. No one told me. I, I looked miserable. I became dark. I became an ugly person inside. And I was scared. I didn't want to go because I, people would say, black people don't go to therapists. Um, finally, my daughter came to me and said, Ma, have you actually looked at yourself? You don't look good anymore. And I knew exactly what was going on. My heart, my kulele lakshini, you know, we go through so much. Um, people don't know. It's, it, it just makes me sad when you know with our government, say we support on Alendela, say Tanda. And I know, you know when you sit back and you, you, you say, who am I going to vote? And you know exactly who you're going to vote for. What do I to Central? Like, do this for our children. When we, today when I get, I got to the school, I mean, our school was the cleanest school. Sorry to, I mean, in the 80s I came here, we were proud to be in the school. When I came here and I looked around, and we have a black government that is supposed to support us and they know our struggles. It's not daily. And you know there's no one else we're going to vote. It's not daily. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to call our music item, Ishmael, to play for us. Just to, Ishmael, please give us something warm so that, because our hearts are heavy right now, the pressure is on you. Thank you. Let's welcome Ishmael. Something we can dance to.
I would like to acknowledge Ama Alumni from 1976. I'm grateful that you guys ran around like Nyakula Gantanguli to put us where we are. Today we have achieved a lot of things because of you. Thank you, we appreciate you. And then Ama Alumni Abu are from different classes in the room, which I would like to acknowledge. All of you guys, um, especially Lagantana Bagamatida. <laughs> That's where I come from. Welcome guys, we love you. And this was a special school. We we I would like to acknowledge Upolin Buyeye, who survived death penalty in 1977. She was sentenced to death with men and was the only woman. Woo wee, yeah, ne? And then Tina Siata, I want to watch 16. Guys, must, 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 let's reflect, let's reflect. And coming next is our keynote speaker. Depression is, is, is my passion. And I, why I, I like talking about it, it's because um, you see a lot of things happen around you. Um, families, abanagula, when you you know we shoot in township most times. Sometimes during lunch, because everyone is standing. God, we have a government that we love, and because they know we're going to vote for them, they keep doing it to us. It depression is serious in the black society. Some of the children were raped, some molested, some come to school being anagugula. And thanks to people like Dr. Maruhanye, who is a specialist in psychiatry, we appreciate, we can relate. When you talk to a psychiatrist, I mean, when I was looking for one, I was referred to a lot of white psychiatrists. Um, and I kept on saying, they won't understand the challenges that I have. I need someone who I can even speak in Sizulu to so that they understand. Because sometimes it's long as it's keeping as it's into. So you want to speak your own language. So I went to a, a black one. Four years later, I'm discharged. I'm not on meds anymore. Um, <laughs> And I'm grateful I listened to my daughter. I was in stubborn. Dr. Marohanya is a specialist in psychiatry who qualified in 2011 through the University of Pretoria. He spent most of his working career in public se sector psychiatry, both in South Africa and the UK. He currently works at Ekuruleni District, overseeing community psychiatry. He is also a lecturer with the Department of Psychiatry at the Vets Medical School. His interests include public health, community psychiatry, thank you, and COVID-related research. He firmly believes that staying mentally healthy is as important as, physically, as physical health. These two health states are intertwined and need equal attention from health authorities. Please help me welcome Dr. Kakisho Maruhanye. Thank you so much for coming.
Good afternoon. Uh, so I just want to adjust this mic a little bit. Okay. Um, like, I said, like I said, my name is Dr. Kariso Marohangi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, both the audience here and uh, at home. Uh, it has indeed been a great privilege to have been offered this opportunity to present this lecture on mental health of the country's youth on a historic and auspicious platform. I'd like to thank the family of the youth, our youth icon, Mr. Tsietsi Mashinini, for affording me this opportunity and trust that I will further add honor to his legacy. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Raitamani and the alumna of Morris Erickson School in Soweto for considering me. This will certainly be um, a highlight of my scholastic uh, career. So I'm going to touch on several aspects of mental health and illness in the youth, but also to highlight certain aspects of the impact of COVID-19 on the youth. Along the way, I'm gonna make some recommendation and trust this won't be missed by the audience here and elsewhere. It's quite a long lecture, so, so I'm hoping, but I'm hoping that throughout you'll be able to take some notes because my, my thinking, like uh, the previous lady was saying, this is a public service announcement. I'm hoping that you're gonna take some elements of the lecture, you know, make a note of them, and then be able to, when you're within, with your families, at a church meeting, in society meetings, or at the Student Representative Council, you should be able to at least impart some of this knowledge uh, to your colleagues. Earlier on, when before, this, before I came here, I was talking to um, um, the alumna and uh, Mr. Machine in the year, and they were telling me about his brother. And they were, I was told that you know, he was quite good in terms of biology, uh, and he took a lot of notes in order to um, remind myself of the, of the subject. I think what is, so I'm not gonna necessarily go through this like a biology lecture, but I'm gonna be talking about a series of uh, studies that we've done in South Africa that point the various aspects of mental health that I feel are important for us to understand what is going through in the psyche of the young, of young people. Uh, one of the researchers that I looked at, uh, I looked at was Facet uh, Kamen, and she writes that adolescent and emerging adulthood is marked by heightened stress experience, and therefore it's likely to be a period of internalizing psychopathology, example, depression, where it develops. The personal, academic, and social pressures that adolescents face could either be viewed as dependent, independent, uncontrollable, or controllable. Dependent stressors are those that individuals feel that are within their control, even though they may not be within their control. If they cannot cope with these stressors, they can lead to insomnia, limited physical activity, inadequate diet, and substance use disorder. Facet Kamen also points out that from other studies, depressed individuals exhibit helplessness to controllable stresses, for example, daily hassles, whilst healthy individuals only exhibit such helplessness for controllable stresses, for example, COVID-19. Whereas both daily hassles and stressful life events can lead to depressive symptoms, I would like to propose that parents and guardians should continuously observe whether young persons in their care are coping with the daily hassles of life. If they cannot, it should trigger questions like, could this be a sign of depression? Experience also informs us that when a young person capitulates or has a nervous break breakdown after a stressful life event, the daily life hassles have already reduced their psychological resilience reserve over the preceding years. Therefore, the potential of common daily events being significant pressure points on the emotional state of a young person should not be underestimated. It is often the case that affected individuals and psychiatrists would be asked, why does this individual have depression? In an, in an article titled Biological, Psychological, and Social Determinants of Depression by Remis, Even the additional social determinants of depression 
maybe so linear and pervasive that others may feel that the depressed person is weak and does not want to absorb the social pressure that everybody else has to. A single pressure point that is time limited may be endured, but if these points continuously accumulate without giving the individual a break, the resultant chronic inflammatory process would put the person at risk of depression and anxiety. Therefore, each, person, each individual right now may be having in, in invisible molecular changes and altered gut environment, physical states, and common but sustained social pressure that put them at risk of persistent or major depressive state. In a nutshell, it is not the depressed person's fault that they are depressed and it may never be apparent. What is more critical to interrogate is if our friend, partner, and relative has signs and symptoms of depression, which could be express sadness, insomnia, poor appetite, fatigue, forgetfulness, and suicidal ideas. If this is the case, the individual should be supported to seek help. Now, there are other factors for current psycho, psycho psychopathology that could have taken place years ago. These are called adverse childhood experiences, which are stressful and traumatic events that can affect the development of the child. And Yama writes that these are found to, have, found to produce biological memories that weaken multiple developing body systems, such as stress response, cardiovascular and immune systems, and the metabolic regulatory controls. These can lead to social... Examples of uh, adverse childhood experiences include sexual, physical, and emotional abuse, and signs of household dysfunction. What are these signs? Substance abuse, mental illness, and domestic violence in the household. Emotional or physical neglect, parental divorce and separation can also be described as adverse childhood experiences. Unfortunately, these adverse childhood experiences are still occurring in modern South Africa. In 2015, study of both the rural and uh, urban adolescents, 18 of 18% 18 of rural adolescents and 19% of urban adolescents reported frequent physical and emotional abuse. Sexual abuse towards women and men also remains a frequent occurrence. A study of rural women and men revealed that 40% and 16% respectively experienced sexual abuse before the age of 19, 18. I deliberately mention rural women and, and men because due to the rural-urban migration that is an established feature of the South African landscape, some within urban populations may still be carrying scars of sexual abuse that, they may, that, that occurred when they were still staying in a rural area. Now, help-seeking behavior is a major limiting, limiting step in closing the treatment gap. By help-seeking behavior, is, we're saying that the ability of one to go and seek a doctor when they are not well. Uh, so your daughter did help you in terms of that, but we would like this to be spontaneous. But there are reasons why this may be challenging. Individuals and families do not easily seek formal and external help, even when there are signs of emotional distress or mental illness, according to Samari et al. Looking at various studies, it has been estimated that the median 12-month prevalence rate of depression in late adolescents is roughly similar to that seen in adults. This illustrates that depression in, in, in the youth is as much a problem as it is in the adults. Despite this, there's a large treatment gap of 75% of adolescents not receiving treatment. This could be to reduce help-seeking behavior on the part of the adolescents and their family. Why would this be the case? Why is there delayed presentation of, uh, to healthcare facilities? Well, it could be stigma, perceived attitude of healthcare professionals, low perceived need for help, a belief that the individual can solve the problem themselves, lack of knowledge and signs of mental illness, waiting for approval from families before seeking external help and financial concerns. Ingerson has, Inghouse and Al, and Al have wondered about how we could facilitate positive health-seeking behavior. Looking at previous research on their own, they propose that mental health literacy basically an awareness of the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety, social support and encouragement from others, creating positive experiences for adolescents and young adults when they see them, 
So if the next time I see a young person, I must create a positive experience. I must not be there to shout at them and blame them for their depression. Because otherwise, they're going to tell their peers that you, know, you shouldn't bother going and seeing a psychiatrist. We must create trust in the provider and improve access to mental health facilities, including in schools and universities. These are some of the elements that will encourage positive health-seeking behavior. I'm also going to touch on the issue of suicide. Suicide is a growing public health concern. Official statistics in South Africa suggest that the prevalence of suicide is 14 per 100,000 people in the population. In the South African Stress and Health Study, which collected data between January 2002 and June 2004, the estimated lifetime prevalence rate of suicidal ideation was 9%. Suicide plans was 4% and attempts was 3%. Women reported twice as many attempts as men. All, med all mental illness and disorders were significant risk factors for lifetime suicide attempt and substance abuse heightened suicide attempt risk. There is a recently published study that took place over 20 years and it examined 8,500 8, suicide in South Africa. Completed suicide were highest in the category of 15 to 44 Black African men accounted for 52% of suicide deaths. This, with uh, <clears throat> those with any education, had increased odds of dying by suicide compared to those uh, without education. So the notion that you know somebody is educated, somebody's got a degree, therefore they're protected from suicide, should be re-examined. The risk of dying by suicide increased as education level increased. Employment was a risk factor for suicide. And today there's been a lot of uh, talk about people being unemployed, the youth being unemployed, and immediately, immediately we should be wary that um, those individuals may be at risk of suicide. It was also noted that being married was associated with increased risk of suicide compared to widows and divorced persons. Uh, they suspect that interpersonal difficulties such as marriage problems, family conflict, domestic violence may play an important role. Now, marriage is a long-standing and cherished relationship status in South Africa and the world. No one is calling for the banning of marriages, but rather increased vigilance and support for individuals within marriage. And I mention marriage because young people also get married. It's not only a preserve of old people or older people. The culture of looking away and not speaking out about one's marital problems for fear of isolation, ridicule, judgment is pervasive and not easily resolved. The lack of reporting of marital problems, especially domestic violence, should be further explored and researched. Hanging was the most frequently used suicide method in South Africa, accounting for 47% of all suicide deaths in keeping with previous studies. Due to the easy availability of objects to hang oneself in the household, it will be an enormous challenge if we wish to institute pre prevention methods to curb this practice. Rather, we should be looking for early signs of depression so that we can get the, treatment, the, the individual treated. Poisoning through medic medicine ingestion was also a common method of suicide, especially amongst women. Cordwardian insists that further research will need to be established whether the restriction of over-the-counter medication may assist in reducing access to lethal means. So the question becomes, can drug manufacturers and pharmacists reduce the size of over-the-counter medication packets distributed and sold? What about the youth in the South African, in South African townships? Oriat Al examined data from 2,000 participants in a birth to 20 plus study, which looked at children born in Soweto, here in Soweto, from birth up until the age of 28. The findings included, included the following. Females reported having suicidal ideation at a greater frequency to males. Suicide ideation uh, rates peaked at the age of 17 and decreased thereafter. And social economic adverse, adverse, adversity, low birth weight, higher birth order, so those who were, who were, the, who were first born or second born or third born, um, adverse childhood uh, experiences, and childhood externalizing problems. So children who have, for example, ADHD or antisocial personality were associated with uh, social uh, suicidal ideation. 
Therefore, there's a need to address social and environmental adversities and attend to childhood externalizing problems in the community level. A strengthened mental health care in the community, and this is what I'm doing in Ikurleni and everywhere else, allows for a, a early identification of such childhood externalizing problems and management thereof. Another study in Cape Town, done in 2008, revealed that anger-related problems, low self-esteem, perceived stress, unmet school goals. So if the child, I think any child when he goes to school, they want to do well, they want to pass, they want to get 80%, 90%. So if the child is not achieving that, it is as much as a bother to the parent as it is to the child. And in some instances, this can predict suicidal behavior. In Ipopo, studies on adolescents found that family conflict, lack of knowledge of the availability of counselors, perceived accusations of negative behavior, inadequate social support, past family and, P and peer suicide attempts, as well as poor living uh, uh, circumstances were significantly associated with suicidal behavior. Researcher Shilubani points out that other studies show that suicide attempts, suicide attempters do provide clues pr prior to the, to the attempt. And this is very important. So what are some of these clues that maybe a young relative could have given you before they attempted suicide? This could be they talked about suicide. They had sleeping and eating problems. They withdrew from friends. They gave away prized possessions. They lost interest in their personal appearance and they started taking unnecessary risks. These are the signs that I'm sure most of you have seen in some of our relatives, and these should be warning signs of impending suicide. It is a checklist that parents and guardians can use to indicate that there is going to be a problem here. But teachers can also help. In a 2015 published study, five focus groups discussions were conducted with 50 high school teachers in Limpopo uh, province. The results demonstrated that teachers lack knowledge in the warning signs of suicidal behavior among students. Let's consider for a moment that most schools will have one or two teachers who are regarded as first aiders looking to attend to physical health emergencies. Considering the emergency status of suicidal ideation, should all teachers not be reviewed as psychological first aiders who are trained to detect the, the, the warning signs I just mentioned and engage a referral system that enables the scholar to receive help. Substance use and uh, uh, self-harm. Given that 50% of those with mental illness could have substance use disorder as well, it is not surprising that those who, are, who, are chronically, who chronically use substances may self-harm. Some of them may end up uh, at an emergency and uh, excellent emergency department in any hospital in South Africa. These, students, these patients, often young, could be assessed by a casualty officer, but what happens to them after their assessment? According to a study done in 2014 and 2015 in an urban hospital, 37% of them reported chronic um, substance use, and most, likely were, were, most of them were likely to be male. Some even had prior, self, a history, a prior history of self-harm. Unfortunately, a proportion of those with chronic substance use that were reported, that were referred to a psychiatric consult, for a psychiatric consultation were less than those who did not have the problem. This clearly belies or goes against research showing that mental illness and substance use to go together. We should not be in a rush to get young men sober and discharged from casualty. Rather, we should be referring them for further psychiatric assessment. And this is the thing about uh, mental health and mental illness. An affected person will probably, in their lifetime, only give you one or two signs. And it's important for you to be alert of those signs, otherwise they may not give you another one. They will not come with you with a long story or a long journal about how affected they are. They will say one thing and will hope that you'll pick it up. And how do you, but how do you modify the family environment in order to prevent uh, substance abuse? Increasingly, researchers in prevention science are wondering if there are protective factors that can mediate or moderate the risk of substance use in, in individuals. Looking at family relations, Michelle and Dos Santos remind us that an, an increase in parent-to-parent -parent and parent-to-offspring conflict can increase the risk of, of substance use disorders. Whereas favorable 
family bonds can reduce the risk of future alcoholism. As much as it is a no well-known phenomenon, one cannot forget to mention that children learn behavioral patterns from their social environment, including their family, school, peers, and community institutions. At this point, it is, it is important to, point, uh, to introduce us to the concept of family management. They use this to investigate substance use amongst adolescents in a rehab facility in Pretoria, South Africa. When they talk about family management, they talk about parental monitoring. Is there anyone at home when the child arrives from school? Discipline. How consistent is the discipline procedure that the parents are using? Behavioral control. Which power assertive measures did parents use to control behavior? And reward system. Set in place by parents to reinforce good behavior. And in my experience, my, my, what I've noticed is that the reward system is lacking amongst our parents. Yes, there's punishment, yes, there's discipline, there's strictness, but in terms of reward, it's sorely lacking. Because how do you encourage behavior, by, by good behavior, by acknowledging good behavior? So these schools, when they were in the 1970s or beyond, when somebody does well, they get an award. What happens? The person continues to study hard so they can get more awards. The same thing with good behavior, even at home. If somebody does well, you must encourage it. Otherwise, they'll, and if, if, they, if you only acknowledge bad behavior, then they'll probably just continue with the bad behavior. So any parent right now should examine their own parenting methods along the lines of the following findings. So these are the findings that they found in these uh, individuals who were at a drug rehabilitation uh, facility. They found that low parental monitoring, so if you don't know about your, ch your child's activities, is associated with increased likelihood of engagement in alcohol use and illicit substance use. More parental monitoring and supervision lead to the delay in substance use initiation and the frequency thereof. Increased risk factors for substance uh, disorders included parents who scored low in sharing, behavioral control through guilt, parental strictness, and affection provision. Now, emotional sharing and interpersonal sharing with, adult, with, with adolescents fosters warmth, trust, and a belief that the parent is involved in their lives. This pattern of parental behavior can be regarded as a form of indirect parental control. An increase in parental emotional support and positive evaluation is associated with a decrease in intensity in cannabis use. Lower levels of parental rewards were associated with higher risk of uh, alcohol use. Limited and inconsistent rewards for positive behavior was associated with increased risk of substance use, violence, and delinquency. So it is pretty clear what particular type of, behavior, uh, of, man of family management and parental behavior is required in order to curb future substance use in adolescents, which in turn reduces the chances of mental illness. So for me, things like something is very, very important um, because in future, that's why they end up having mental illness. So we can curb the use of substances, there'll be a lower incidence of mental disorders in future. I'd also like to talk about the challenges of, of, of varsity life. Uh, Banjis et al. revealed that 18.1% of first year students utilize healthcare services at two South African universities. More worrying was that only a fraction 30% of those with mental disorders received treatment. Even after a suicide attempt, the treatment rate was only half of the time. So university man management should start asking themselves, these student clinics that they have, are they being used effectively, and are they serving their purpose? It is also important to know that there are multiple new factors that emerge when a young person decides to go to university. They have to take on a lot of responsibilities of their own. They have to create new social support structures and navigate the environment. Uh, those who do stay but are not coping may end up underperforming academically, result to substance use and developing psychopathology. But it's not all doom and gloom. Some, st some, some uh, students have got the emotional, social, and cognitive resources to deal with some of the issues that harm them. But help is still needed in those few instances which students has appraised as being beyond their coping abilities. So by the time a, a young student comes to you, it is not like you know they, this, this, these are all the problems that they can come with you. They have resolved that part of the problems I can solve by myself, 
but mommy and daddy, I need help with this particular one. This is your opportunity for you to get involved in your child's uh, life adversity. If you don't want to help them in this case, how are you ever going to help them in any other matters? Yes, some of these stresses, we may think that some of these stresses are learning opportunities for parents. Basically, we're trying to say, just get on with it so that you can grow and become an adult. But some of these stresses are fear-provoking stresses that lead to depression and anxiety. And I don't think one should be bothered about the problem that the child presents to you and say whether this is a serious one or this is not a serious one. For the fact that they brought it to you, it means that it's serious enough and you must, you must pay attention to it. At the end of the day, both university and parents should wonder if their, children, their child or students have acquired several competencies that a varsity student should have. And I'd like to talk about these competencies. What do we want? What kind of youth, what kind of university students, what kind of young adult we want? We want those who can recognize and manage their emotions, set achievable goals, establish positive relations, and make safe choices. These are the self-regulation traits that are likely to adjust better with university life and adult life even. When we look at the COVID-19 itself, um, so it has truly emerged as a total public health crisis with individuals' uh, physical, mental, social, economic conditions being affected at risk. Considering that we're in the, still in the midst of COVID-19, questions about the impact of the pandemic on the mental state of the nation should still be asked. We're going to be moving away from acute hospital uh, base capacity, but now we should be asking ourselves how are we going to present <coughs> prevent suicide because of the deteriorated financial situation we are in and the social isolations. At the beginning of the pandemic, Supermani et al. spoke about what we can expect in the, in the pandemic. They are worried about impending anxiety, fear of infection and death, and also the development of mental health disorders like depression and so forth. A survey was done of 500 girls in six districts in South Africa. And it discovered that COVID-19 restrictions increase stress and anxiety. Apart from the restrictions brought on by the uh, lockdown, what, what were the other reasons why this ki these uh, girls became uh, distressed? Strained family relations, increased uh, fear of domestic violence, household in unemployment, economic stress, and food insecurity. When these children, uh, how did it manifest? They had hopelessness. Boredom, fear, isolation, and frustration. And, and I like to emphasize these, these, uh, these signs. When it comes to depression, it's not only that you see somebody who is, uh, um, who is very thin, or somebody who's trying to attempt suicide, or somebody who's uh, being dramatic and aggressive. Simple things like boredom, fear, frustration can be a sign of trouble. But it was also acknowledged that there were young women and, and women and adults and girls who also coped better with COVID-19. And how did they do this? They took one step at a time. They maintained hope in the face of odds. They simply accepted the situation and they were patient that things will improve. This is very important to take one, things at a time, one thing at a time. So these are the traits that we could include in our programs where we look at uh, preventing mental illness in future. Two other studies also confirmed that there was an increase in depressive symptoms compared to COVID-19. So what are our recommendations? Um, first of all, we say, <clears throat> I think, that mental literacy should be the start of any suicide prevention program. Young persons, their associates and parents should be aware of signs of depression, fatigue, insomnia, and self-blame, and warning signs of depression. Our suicide prevention program should also include systematic changes such as providing effective mental health care, transforming the mental health care system and community interventions. This uh, transformed, thank you. This transformed mental health care system should be accessible to all vulnerable uh, individuals, including first-year university students. One of, the, one, of, one of the most important stakeholders in parasuicide and completed suicide case prevention is the individual's family. We need to be aware of how family can mitigate the risk of suicide and, or compound it. We need to look at family cohesion, cognitive connectedness, 
and openness as protective factors against suicide. Like everywhere else in the world, adolescents and youth are increasingly finding themselves distressed. Our job as, as adults is not necessarily to blame ourselves or wish away the distress. There's no apparent cause, uh, apparent causative factor for this rise in the prevalence of common mental illness in the youth. Our responsibility is to ask ourselves as community adults and local youth health authorities, what opportunities can we provide for youth support and what alternative outlays for teenager and young adults uh, and angst. We should wonder how we can prevent childhood related traumas which often end up in the development of common mental disorders later on in life. We should set up clinics and units with well-trained health professionals to properly assess ad adolescents and young adults, uh, young adults. We should use family management and parental behavior to reduce social uh, suicidal ideation and substance use in children. COVID-19, as, as we've noted above, was a clear reason to do that. But even without COVID-19, the youth in this country were dealing with multi-year pandemic of unemployment, multi-decade incidents of childhood trauma, and this should be addressed. When the lethality of COVID-19 decreases, we should be wondering, we should be wary that the mental, mental health disorders may increase in, in frequency, and with that comes with uh, lethality as well. But also, uh, finally, I would like to um, acknowledge just this conversation, like I said, that I had earlier with uh, Mr. Machinini and Mr. Makaule, and we're talking about uh, TSC Machinini. And what I gathered from that is that he was clearly a well-adjusted gentleman. Um, he used to go to the library, he used to read a lot of books. Um, so, but you need that. You need to be adjusted, you need to be mentally healthy in order to make the change that you can make. I would like to think that if Mr. Machinini at that time was under pressure, was distressed, we wouldn't have seen the changes that we've seen. So if we always expect, the, we always ask ourselves, what should the youth, why are the youth just sitting in the corner, why are they not doing anything? But part of the reason for that is that mentally they may not be in the right state for them to make the changes. We should be looking at our individual youth and, and trying to see how we can improve their mental, their mental health so that they can also be the change makers in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. I would like to thank our sponsors, Telcom, Brand SA, Department of Communication, Putanani Trust, Lucia Gess, your daughter. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, I wonder who is Bambeni, who is on Kilindenga, who is Dr. Asibion. Is there something that we actually, that, that makes sense and that hits home? Well, I think it's very important. And I don't agree with the Mbogodo name uh, because we were told to be Mbogodo so that people could abuse us. Sikhalesi uh, strong, ngoba abo baba mele mabashaya sina jeli mundu, and and then and the marriage one actually hit home, and most of 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 the depression that I came with came from my divorce, and everyone keeps saying it was strong, it was strong, it was strong, yes, but eh ya no agbe strong kunzima. And thank you so much for people like you. But I'm going to say something to the teachers. I know the teachers at school have a hard time. Mobile. dress from home, from the fights the parents have, um, from everything that happened at home. Most parents aren't working. I don't know how practical it is for for the kids to be able to tell anyone problems. Most parents wake up at four o'clock. When they come back, the bosses have kicked their butts and they're agitated. So when you try and say anything to your parent, they push you, they, you know, it, it's very difficult. So I think um, the day our government helps people to have jobs, 
and then we can deal with a lot of challenges that we have mentally because Mama now umsebenzi ulamba ezimizinto azikoshap abe baba bayasithuka estradeni they swing at us they calling us um, the other word that I wouldn't mention and um, women are raped literally every day um, and and you expect us to be loving wives when you get home it's very difficult and Kota, um, I wish everyone luck. M mental freedom is, 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 is a good thing. Once you fix yourself inside, everything falls into place and you are a better person. You're not as grumpy, you are not as sad, and you become a better person to everyone. And up next, we have Ooh, Mr. Chabulan Makubani. He's a former MK soldier a member of the June 16 detachment. He was deployed to the cultural department where he became a founder member of Amandla Cultural Ensemble, which was directed by Jonas Gwangwa. He performed with the formidable jazz musician like Victor Antoni, Mekom Robata, just to name a few. He was the director, wow, of music at SA Army, music office responsible for the SA Army ceremonial band 9724. He retired from the SA Army in 
Thank you so much. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge um, an ex MK combat combatant. It's long, saying shy a man. An MK cadre and a general from the SANDF. Uh, he also comes from Morris Isaacson, 1976 generation of the Morris Isaacson alumni. But some good things are the alumni. So I'm not going to sing since I don't my, my prefect must be happy. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for that memory. It's people like you we are grateful to. Whether if you guys went there, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. I repeat it again and again, and uh, everyone else will think I'm overreacting. Yeah, well. We serve the people of South Africa. Yeah. I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, wow. Can you please, can you follow it up? Can you, is she play some music? Go back. No more, I'm a calm. This is okay. Excellent, in a few minutes. We are almost done. Can you hit us with like something that we can chant to? Please. Uh, sorry, moment of silence. Basata ba ngu to which song? Ndlanda au sizi la. Maybe ma ngu kala something kundo zenza la. Au kala something ya pentlanda.
Thank you. Will Babu's Tapasin will take over for me with the Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the TAT machine and the family uh, for being here. We are honored. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Sissi. That was a splendid job you did. Um, Doc, food for thought. Thank you so very much. Um, to our guests here, welcome. And thank you again for your presence and for the attention that you've given to Dr. Tamaruhanye. Just to reflect on a few things, uh, Doc, you talked about adverse childhood experiences. That was quite interesting. I believe that all of us have gone through such, if not most of us, you know. Maybe an exceptional few families who were not like protected or whose parents had that heightened sense of awareness would be able to protect their kids from that. But as you all know, but what about the king? So called being strong. And all that, you know, ah, required, and all that, you know. So, Doc, you become one area that was interesting of me. You talked about um, 15 or 14 per 100,000 suicidal, suicidal rate, 14 people per 100,000. That is quite a scary, you know, statistic. You know, um, it, 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 it leaves one wondering, Horem. What it is that's going on out there? But you've made so much sense of a lot of things, But final of the things that, you know, piqued my interest, Haholu, you know, um, when we talked about being married, having a higher risk of suicide, you know, that's something that we'd like to discuss with you at some point in the future. <laughs> but of course, um, one thing that I want to fully embrace when you said teachers should be suicidal first aiders. You know, hopefully with the questions that come at some point during this period, you'll be able to give us more. Uh, Mama, first your name and then your question. Tumela, San Bonani, Ikamalami Unomsa, Wagasindan. I have a, a first hand experience with e depression with three of my daughters when their father was shot dead. Um, the last one was doing her fourth year in actual science at Stellenbosch. And she only saw it on the telly that my dad has been shot. Hmm. And she saw the picture. Since then, she dropped out. She didn't finish her fourth year of actual science. She is on antidepressants as I'm talking to you now. Wow. She lives with me. She came back from varsity. And fortunately, um, I've got a medical background as well. I'm a nurse. Mm. And so I'm doing everything to support her, although it's hard as a mother as well. But we're getting there. And I'd like to ask a question. How long does one stay on antidepressants? For how long is she supposed to be on antidepressants? Thank you. Any other questions? Um, okay, uh, the mic. Uh, there's a gentleman over there. Do you have one mic only? Okay, uh, Osmo Kati, from there. The, the, there's a lady in that orange, yeah, or pink jacket, yeah, like it. There was. Rotman, your name first? 
Um, retired General Stabi Somashobo, um, a student, Samu, signed 1976, yeah. together with Donald Bashini. Wow. Um, very proud to be here. I'm bragging, <laughs> standing here, bragging really about this high, mighty Morris, this mm -hmm. highest high school. Uh, my question is, Dr. Uh, Marukhan, taking us through as a society, Hahulu Runabatu Babantu, African people. I think we're a case, a psychological case, if you look what has happened to us to date. The problem that we are coming across now is a corruption and so forth. They could also be arising from that. But but let me get to the point. We have heard from our youth, our proud youth today, how they feel through poetry, through the speeches that they delivered here. Mm -hmm. What is going on right to the very youth, the future. O.R. Tambo says, a nation that neglects its youth does not deserve a future. So it is right now. How many of us, what, what community are we as psychologists do we have? Because this is a national, it's a national issue. It's one, it's that key, key issue, the psychology of the people, mm -hmm. the majority of the people. We coming from exile, coming from prisons, coming from poverty, the poverty that we're in, that we're swelling in, we need to be cancelled. Yeah. All of us. Mm. What can be done that you maximize yourself, doctor, mm. and many others? Of course, as you're encouraging us, that as parents, uh, how we should try and guide the youth, but you need to be guided as well. Mm. How can you do it? Uh, Doc, would you like to th take the third question and then re address the first th th three round of questions before we move to the next three? Okay. Can I see her? Thank you very much. My name is Namsa Mazwai. I'm from an organization called Funket. I'm Walking. Um, thank you very much for your insights on uh, mental health. Um, my question, and really it's to pose to all of us, um, really I think as Sowetans and as South Africans, we need to accept that we are who we have been waiting for. We are who we have been waiting for. And I think that's the biggest challenge, that we are not taking and owning our spaces. Um, our organization really believes that community safety is the key to unlocking a lot of um, the challenges that we're facing as society. And in safer communities, there's more job opportunities. In safer communities, um, there's a better lifestyle. People can walk more, um, which deals with mental health. And walking is very good for mental health, but we are in this state of anxiety and fear that we don't even get to walk. And we expect the government to fund something that doesn't really need to be funded. It shouldn't be funded. Um, not in the sense that it shouldn't, but I'm saying in the sense that we can't afford to fund all the depression, but we can afford to deal with the crime. So what I wanted to ask you, doctor, is have you done any studies that have looked at the impact of community safety or the absence of community safety on mental health? Thank you. Doc, you can remain where you are. You can take them from there. Okay. Um, yeah. Th thank you for the questions. Um, in terms of the the, the, the first um, speaker or the question, I think what what is important before I even answer how long should uh, a person be on antidepressant? Whenever the, somebody's got a mental illness, I don't think we should also remember that they can have psychotherapy as well. So it's just not a part of uh, a process of people getting medication, but psychotherapy as well. 
uh, and I would like our people to be more open to that. Uh, already is a struggle for them to take medication, but whenever you talk about them getting uh, counseling or speaking to a psychologist, there's a, there's a bit of reluctance towards that. And the fact of the matter is that it's a combination of the two that leads to a better outcome. You know, if you're only on medication, maybe some of the page, maybe some of, some of your illness are getting better. But if I combine the two, then I've got a better chance of that. Generally speaking, we're looking at about six to nine, six to nine months of being on antidepressant. The tricky bit is that uh, within about two months or even less than that, you start feeling better. And when you start feeling better, a lot of people stop taking uh, medication. And this is a problem because we still need the medication to change the chemical imbalance in your brain. So we encourage anyone that we put on antidepressants, whether they're getting better or not, to continue taking their medication. And the thing is that if the medication is not working, please, you're welcome to go back to your psychiatrist to say, this is not happening. Because even within our practice, there's first line, second line, combinations. There's all sorts of trickery we can do with medication in order to get someone better. It cannot be a case where somebody goes to a psychiatrist, takes medication for six months, but they're still depressed because what's going to happen encourages the idea that our medication doesn't work. So we must go back. It's like the same when you go to a GP. Your headache is not better. You go back to a GP, isn't it? So we must also go back to our, ourselves. Now, and then um, the gentleman spoke about uh, the availability of counselors in the community. Um, unfortunately, <coughs> um, specialists like myself are not produced in, in, in droves and holds in, uh, holds in the country. Um, and I, but there are colleagues who can help in terms of support and counseling, and those are your social workers, those are your uh, racial counselors, and I can see already shaking your head. <laughs> but, but I think I need to emphasize that we need a whole team to do this. It will, it will be almost near to impossible to have a psychiatrist to cover the the, the extent of, of depression in the country. So we, we need, uh, so I would like us to start acknowledging allied professionals as being um, part of the solution as well. The thing what they do is that they would see the person, but if the person is, is, is sort of reporting very serious signs of depression, then they'll get the person to come to me. You know, so, it, so it's not the case that all the depression that you see is <coughs> need to see a psychiatrist. Some of them can be helped uh, through counseling. So we're hoping that as the government employs more social workers, more psychologists, um, and, 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 and research counselors as they're doing in Gauteng, then we'll get to have more people accessing the, the service. Um, and in terms of um, what, what kind of worries me is, 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 is the fact that um, we're still worried about uh, adverse childhood experiences. Whenever I meet my patients and they tell me some of the things that they've been through, I have to ask them, when did this happen? Did this just happen last year? You know, and, I, and I find that I can't, I can't fathom that. Uh, perhaps back in the days of apartheid, we can assume that some of the things could have happened. Perhaps in the rural areas could have happened. But what is worrying me is that this um, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, this neglect is happening right now. And I think as a, as a community, community leaders, we must do something in order to correct this. Um, it's, it's almost near, I, as a psychiatrist, may not be able to deal with it, but it's for the community and the parents to say, we're going to put a stop to these adverse uh, childhood, uh, childhood experiences. And the same thing with the community, uh, uh, community sa safety. Um, I think, again, it depends on community leaders to stand up and create a foster uh, uh, an environment where that could be established. Part of the reason, I'm, I'm, I'm not a uh, sociologist as such, but part of the reason why we're having this crime could be because people are unemployed, like you were saying earlier. Um, so we need to think about how we can get more and more people employed, more people waking up in the morning, going to work, do something with their lives. And by doing something with your lives, you tend to then sort of stay away from substance abuse. And with that, hopefully, then people are not sitting in the corner manifesting ideas of how they can commit crime. So we need to look at employment and see how they can take people out of the streets into formal uh, activities and therefore hopefully using less, uh, being less involved in crime. Thanks. 
Um, thanks, Doc. We're going to take the second round of questions, then we'll move on to the third round. Hopefully, we don't know whether it's the final one or not, but we'll definitely have a third round of questions. Uh, Doc, I've been informed that you're going to need to come up to the podium because there's an SABC mic here, plus the camera has been set up for this yeah, direction. Thank you. I just have a short question. Do people in our communities know what depression is? And are there programs or other initiatives where depression is actually explained to them at their frame of reference? Do people actually know that when this is happening, I'm actually experiencing depression? Are there programs for that? Are there initiatives for that? And is it possible that we as young people get to um, initiate programs like that and have programs that that can actually educate people about depression and make them aware of depression that it is something that is very serious and it needs to be treated. Okay, so um, um, thank you. I'd just quickly like to um, thank, and I, 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 I'm doing this deliberately, um, Imoris Isaacson Alumni School, School Administration, the Machinini Family, as well as the Putanang Trust, um, because um, the point that I'd like to make in the question, um, partly they're answering this um, point. So um, thank you to um, Doc. Um, so my name is Lula Mazamini. <laughs> I come from an organization called Insights Innovation. Um, and uh, when we come to the school here, Noman Tandim Kize, who is uh, class of 1976, um, and thanks to Mr. Maisela, um, no mem no no mem, no no Mr. Shavangani for the opportunity they've given us. So, Doc. Here's an issue. Um, thus, I thanked um, the organizers of, of this um, event is right here at this very school. Um, how do we address these issues? Because all the socioeconomic issues that um, the children bring to the school emanate from home, and they bring them at school, and they become the school's problem. You must see, when you come to this school and any other school, I would like to address this very school that we're at with this amazing facility, um, is uh, how the school exec, the SMT, School Man Management Team, Uliander sitting right here, um, being the school leadership, how they run around like headless, well, not headless chicken, because you can see that they've got a vision to, to make the school um, uh, you know, a place, uh, a home away from home. How do, we, uh, how do we start right here with this very audience? And some of our speakers, um, our youth, have um, attested to this. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, this is a great platform. Uh, we've got some very influential people here. All of us are very influential. And I'm encouraged by the principle, you're born to, you know. Um, and we can go on and on and on. Thank you for this opportunity, everybody. I'm still coming at the back. Good, good afternoon, and thank you, doctor. My name is Pearl Lutuli, and I'm also an alumni of this school. As you were talking, I literally felt overwhelmed because I look around me, my community, my family, and every uh, symptom and cause that we have talked about. I see it. I've seen it. And so in my mind, we, we need more than this. Uh, Kutua, 
to be a parent, you don't go to school to be a parent. And most of us became parents and uh, we learned how to react or how to raise our children based on what, how we were brought up. But there's just so much brokenness in our communities, in our homes, and everywhere around us. And so it's an unfair question to ask you, but I am asking everybody and all of us, how do we break this cycle? There is just so much grief. You know, if you look around in our, our children, most every other home these days are drug addicts. How did we get there? You know, how do we change this thing of children being unemployed, children ending up in drugs, children killing themselves because they are depressed? I'm sure there is much more that we should be talking about or doing as a nation. Uh, Nomsa mentioned the issue of community safety and I'm glad Dantla Lux is here who started doing something about it. Two weeks ago, in my family, we were robbed. We had thugs coming in, pointing guns at us. I was seeing a gun for the, at that close range for the first time in my life. And I'm not young, and there were kids there. How are they supposed to cope? They to took all our phones, but where, where do you go? What, what do we do? How do we break the cycle? Thank you. Um, Doc, you're going to need to come up here. I have one other question from our Zoom platform, from Sheila Makate. Uh, she asked, Doctor, can you kindly deal with the issue of intergenerational trauma and mental health? Okay, over to you. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for those, for those questions. Um, in terms of uh, the knowledge of, of depression, I, I think that, that that's very, very important. I mean, that's, a, that's what we should start off in, on a basic level. Um, and, and in this lecture, this opportunity for me to, to, to stand here and talk about depression is, is, is one such opportunity. Um, unfortunately, you know, we don't have enough of these platforms for us to do that as a as a psychiatrist. But when I think about answering your question, I'm thinking of maybe three areas where we could uh, spread the, the gospel or the knowledge of depression. And I'm thinking of as I was driving you know, up uh, into, into, the, into the, the township, there are lots of billboards. You know, there are lots of billboards and the billboards, unfortunately, you know, there's all sorts of things on the billboards. But you know, could some of these billboards be used to, to talk about the signs and symptoms of depression. You know, the, the Department of Health can simply do that, to say that, you know, put out, out there that these are the signs of uh, symptoms of depression, and we have these, you must go to your local clinic. Um, so maybe billboard advertising is one. Another one is that uh, I'm not too sure what, what, what exactly takes place in the life orientation curriculum in the schools, but perhaps there should be a section there where they talk about mental health and mental illness to the kids. Um, that, that should be part of the new curriculum where you know, the, there's a dedicated um, lecture, on, uh, uh, lecture on that. They talk about the physical aspects of, of, of our body. Everybody knows that. But in terms of the mental, mental, mental aspect, they don't talk about that. And that should be part of the curriculum. And in terms of the workplace, I'm thinking that in the workplace, they get all sorts of uh, emails and newsletters. Those, some of the newsletters must talk about mental, mental illness. So mental illness should not be a, a, a topic that we hide on the side. We should be part and parcel whenever we talk about uh, the health, the health of, of, of the person. In terms of um, the schools and, and, and how we can assist that, um, some of the schools, uh, especially in maybe the advantaged areas, they've got school counselors, uh, school counselors or psychologists. And perhaps we need to have that more within the township environment. It may not mean that, you know, Morris Arison will have his own counselor and then another will have their own counselor. 
Perhaps the Department of Education can hire one, one school psychologist and say, you take care of these 10 schools. These are your 10 schools to look after them. You're going to go there on a rotational basis to look and monitor the, the, the mental health of those students. Um, and as much as I'm putting a lot of pressure on the teachers to, to see the warning signs, they also need help. And it would be good for them when they pick up the sign to know that, oh, by the way, there's a, um, a particular person who comes and they can relate this, uh, this, uh, this concern that they have to that, to, to that person. And in terms of, uh, use the term uh, uh, mentally, the reactive, and, and I think that's what I'm trying to drive away from. We need to stop this reactive parenting. We should ask ourselves that if somebody's going to have a child or somebody's think about a child, how am I going to manage the situation? And I spoke about some of the issues. I spoke about the reward system that you must have in your mind. I spoke about you know, monitoring the activities of your, of your child and adolescents. Um, I spoke about sharing with the child. The whole idea of I'm an adult, there are the children, I cannot share certain things is a problem. We need to bridge that. So certain things, you know, if mommy is having a bad day at, uh, at work, they must be able to share it with their child. So the child can also feel that if I've got a bad day at school, I can also share with mommy. Because children are sort of adopting your own behavior. So if you keep them quiet all the time, when you get home, you just lock yourself in a room, they're going to do the same thing. So we need to have a, a family management plan on how to manage our children so that hopefully this will mediate or moderate the risk of uh, substance substance abuse. In terms of um, uh, inter intergenerational trauma, I, mean, I think this is the worry that I have, that, that why is it that things that used to happen in the 60s and 70s are still happening now? You know, and I, I think we we'll all take an active step to, 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 to prevent these things from happening. There shouldn't be an assumption that, you know, my child is always safe. We must always be aware of where our children are and are they safe so that we can make sure that, you know, they're not exposed to trauma and that sort of thing. A thief doesn't need a lot of opportunity. You know, uh, uh, somebody's criminally minded, somebody's going to be abusing a child, doesn't need a lot of opportunity. We need to be monitoring our children even more so that we can stop this in intergenerational um, trauma. And, and my problem with, with, with children or, or young adults going through trauma is that the trauma can remain with them for a long time, 30 years. You know, uh, some of the people that I talk to, the experience that they're talking about that still bothered them happened 30 years ago, but still when you talk to them, they cry about it. You know, so trauma is, 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 a real, is a real problem and we need to curb it, we need to stop it at the beginning so it doesn't happen. But if you do have, if you do have it, please, uh, that's when you can come in for counseling and medication. Thanks. Okay, um, there's a group of three people there. Can I have the last three? The last three after this one. Uh, okay, we take four. Let me give you the last four. Okay. It's one, two. No, 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 no. Regards to the Ebo, I will come up with a list of the Arab. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimantra Sonfari, and um, together with Mepo Lina and the leaders of the Justice System Foundation, mm. it's a generation of the 76 and the 86. Remember, we ask that intergenerational trauma uh, was instilled. Sansan Kirimula, it's like it's a substandard B. When I saw the Tessila uh, uh, students, but we wanted in Jackie Bashebile and all that, so we stayed with us. Um, I want to take you through to, again in 86, it was repeated when the whites were just shooting and all that. So it's a trauma that stayed with us. And something that I see normally around the township is like, what we saw people burning to death, which was also normalized when we were angry, that this is how you re, uh, uh, retaliate. It's also a trauma that stays, they stayed with us and that was normalized. And that was later, you know, being what it is now, where you see people, it's easy for them to commit such a serious crime and it's normalized. So um, actually, let me go back to my question. Uh, before I go to my question, I think I'll just be forward to say, Nepalina, when he, she was uh, telling us about what he went through before uh, he was acquitted of the hang, uh, hangpao. 
and, and he, she will still have to be a mother. I can't tell my story because I don't want to be me. Make the pillar when also you remember through that people, some people were uh, incarcerated and you come back and you fall back and you still have to be put a face. You know, coming here, I saw a lady dressed well and nice. They dress very well, and that inside, that, 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 there's that trauma within them. My question now to you, uh, is to say, oh, I know I've got uh, also a first hand uh, when my son also uh, dropped off of an mechanical engineering, engineering class. Uh, I think affected by my divorce with the father, also physical uh, abuse with the father and all that. And he was very close to me. He used to fight my, my battles. And after everything, you remember with us, I speak with other ladies and I'm, I'm okay, but I leave my kids behind. And he, he was then, after I saw that, uh, how he was now into uh, Dacha. And then he was hospitalized in the 56. But then, how do you give the kids out to diagnose them and use this medication and try them as, as if it's a pig. Because I know he used to cry and say, Mom, this medication is too much for me. My tongue is, is, is ballooning up in my mouth. And you know, that was a trauma to me to say, what did I do to my child? Because after that, he started acting like, a, you know, those people that look alike, he, he, he actually became more sicker than being healed. So how do you then, I, I don't know, I, I heard you talking about a psychotherapy. Why don't you start them with psychotherapy than trying all the medication on them? And it also scares the, the, us to take our kids now to, to hospital because now we are subjecting them to further uh, and being mistreated. Thank and you. When I think uh, I'm going to start now. We are, we are seriously pushing for time now. Yes. Thank you so, so much. I will request that we stick to the questions. I understand okay. the passion. So we still have many other people that we uh, need to cover. She just hand uh, the mic to behind her afterwards. Afternoon, Dogotela, family of Maurice Dogotela, 1975, more than 1976. Put your hand in me. Put your hand in me. Kebata Hotseba Hore. For all the research work which you have done in your facility, I have never mentioned we have a biggest stressors in the country, aka Bonang Ili religion. How much have you actually tapped into religion as being a stressor and a eritisa matata kantun on a daily basis? What a question. What a question. What a question. Parliament. Morning. I think I'm going to save time by not asking a question, but just adding value with comments so that you don't have to respond and you're saving a lot of time. I'm going to try to defend the psychological well-being of our, our, our people. When you look at the audience and the millions of people watching at home, our parents are very reaction reactionary. That's why the triple M scheme this is a single sentence. <laughs> now, when you start speaking words such as depression, very important. You should understand it before you implement it. When you have symptoms that are that are general, because sometimes when you open your eyes in the morning when you wake up, come see me as a doctor then everyone must go see a doctor. So in essence, what I'm trying to get at is that medication yet depression is serious medication. Mm -hmm. Just to give an example, Dr. Yubile Marik Nanaki emphasized, it works on the chemical balance of the brain. And if you're going to say something over and over again, hamamaka kena kwenkum, nitantla mekina le, nikita koko yuko lecture nya tieti, wanaka kena nona depression. And she says that 20 times, she's my mother, at some point I'm going to believe it. So if you talk about one meeting lecture, Pascal is going to be a doctor, but he knows about depression. You can go back. And then lastly, just to bring it back home, because 
this is not an attack on the doctor. I love the doctor and everything the doctor said. But can we not intellectualize all problems that we have as people? Can we not over, over sophisticate practical problems? Majority of our people, doctor, are not educated. We need to remain plugged into the, the, the market that we are dealing with. And the market, if you're talking to black people in particular, is not an educated market, whether we like it or not. So we need to relay messages in a way that we know that it is a, we trust how we deliver it, that they'll understand it and even take it forward. Because when you just look at how we talk about it, it's very dangerous at some times. So how can we have practical solutions? Mazwai also spoke of something, Ari, Ari, let's, let's, have, let's walk because it helps depression. And doctor, you said quite a few things. I'd like to say that things such as depression are a result of, they're not a start of. I get depressed because I'm unemployed. I get depressed because I saw my, 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 my father beating up my mother. I, so, so, so those type of things need to be dealt with. And for me, with all my years of schooling, I've reached one conclusion. Whatever mindset that you want for yourself can only be backed up by the environment you find yourself in. The environment is a true master of the mindset. If you want to be a pilot, you have to associate with pilots. Because if you're associated with soccer players, you might just play in the PSL. You'll never fly any plane. So that's just how simple success is. It's, it's, it's you creating the environment for the mindset that you want. So if you want the nation not to be depressed and you want the nation not to be a traumatized nation and see the things that the, the, the young people are seeing, then we should make sure that there are no drugs sold in the townships. There is no woman that's beating up in the townships. Mm, mm, mm. Otherwise, we are, making, we are creating a market for, for us to now invest in more psychologists and psychiatrists. Go cut them all. 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 Okay, uh, Doc, over to you. Or, uh, oh, okay, because Ntantla did not necessarily ask a question. We are just doing it. Ntantla Mudise, would you like to take that opportunity to ask a question? Yeah. Thanks for, from the organizers, the Martin and family, uh, Dr. Marukhan. Mine, it's an observation that happened maybe 10, 15 years ago, whether you listen to 702, or you started hearing Gogo so and so, and this person is a chartered accountant, this one is this and this. And last year, a young lady came to me, I thought she would be here, I haven't seen her. And she had gone through depression, and eventually, uh, doctors recommended she takes antidepressant, and all they did was to balloon her body. My question is, most of those people eventually move away from uh, Western medication because of the uh, reaction that they get from antidepressant and go to traditional healing. And, mm -hmm. and hence the prevalence of many uh, traditional healers. So it's, it's, it's asking you as an African, how do you reconcile the two? How could uh, your profession uh, accommodate traditional healers in that area to be able to deal with lots of challenges uh, from a mental health point of view? Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think, I know you're making a comment, um, but I would like to emphasize that, you know, there are two sort of distinct concepts here. There's mental health and mental illness. So when it comes to mental illness, that's when you become my business. But I think we need to also emphasize uh, the issue of mental health. How do we keep people mentally healthy so that they, they're emotionally stable? that their thoughts are organized and their behavior is acceptable or, or, or typical. And, and, and issues that we've spoken about, exercise, working, uh, making sure that we uh, don't have these adverse childhood experiences in the first place, dealing with crime, are all to help us for being, for being mentally healthy. So I think that is, that, is, that is very important. We must talk about the social determinants of mental illness and try to curb these and deal with them. 
In terms of um, uh, you know uh, the issues that were raised earlier on, I would like to talk about divorce and, and the fact that uh, most of the people that I've come across, uh, you would ask them a whole lot of issues as to what could have possibly led you to come in to see me, and you looking, then you look at finances and sort of thing. But a lot of them, even when I see them at the age of 30 or 40, they're still talking about the divorce that they went through when they were, when they were, when they were a child. So I'm just trying to say that whenever there's going to be a change in the family system, there's going to be a separation or a divorce, at that point we must make sure that the children get counseling. Uh, we must not just say that this is an adult problem, the child might just cope with it, because years later they become my patient now. And when I ask them what's wrong, they say my parents got divorced 20 years ago. So it's very important that that, that change in the dynamic is, is very traumatic for the child. Um, they're used to a certain system happening in the family, and in, in, in certainty they've got safety. Now that there's a lot of uncertainty, they become unsafe. So we need to get our counseling for our, for our children. In terms of in terms of um, diagnosis, uh, some signs of, of of distress in our children, we must look at when the children withdraw, when there's poor academic uh, performance or when there's aggression. Those are the, some of the symptoms that can point out that, that, that there's, a, there's a problem. And I have to emphasize that doesn't mean that you've got some symptoms of depression, you have to be on medication. You can get counseling, and, and I'm a great believer in that, that can help you. It's only when the counselor or the psychologist feels that you need more, then they can come to us. And, and, and yes, our medication does have adverse effects. There's no doubt about it. Um, but we, as, as doctors, we must learn to use our, our medication um, judiciously so that we don't, we don't, when I first see you, I give you a whole lot of medications and I give you high dose because obviously, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna cope with that. So we also need to know how we're gonna give this, the, these medications. And it's important that, that, doesn't, that just because somebody down, down the road had bad side effects to medication doesn't mean that you know you should stop yourself from getting medication. They may not have been managed properly, for example. So uh, I, I discourage people from saying that. Oh, but that person is fat. I want to be fat. Not necessarily. And you and, and and you're allowed to 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 say to the doctor that you know, doc, I'm particularly worried about gaining weight. Can you make sure that whatever medication you give me doesn't make me gain weight? And not all of our medication uh, does so. Um, in terms of religion. <laughs> I don't know because I really researched that part. I mean, um, it depends. Uh, for some people, religion is, is, is very, very important. It sort of grounds them. It gives them an understanding of how the world works. You know, it gives them a moral compass as to what they should. you find that there's some, uh, there's some traditional healers who say that these symptoms don't fit in with uh, traditional, traditional progression, you need to go and see a psychiatrist and then go over to us. So we can work in tandem. I don't think we should go as two and one and say, either you go this side or you go this side. We work together. All right.
right here. many great things from this very school. So my comment, question, however you take it, is to say this education of liberation was um, driven by, you know, the teachers, the, the, the black uh, power movement. What happened to this education of liberation? Are we still, you know, educating our youth with this education of liberation? I think many um, veterans that are here know about this education of liberation, and we are saying, where is it in our, in our schools, in our youth? And we would love, Tina, as young people, to continue and educate our children about this education of liberation. So I just want to say, let this education of liberation rise. With Thank our you. Community. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, if we make a research on our latest publications, we need to just this one. Now, I have the steps that the research has spoken about. How many of those of us can do it? So I need to take a moment to talk about it. And then the other one is, can you just put in Thank you, thank you, uh, Pramoa. Uh, Doc, uh, there is a request that came through as you come to the podium. Uh, if you could uh, provide some kind of contact details of yours, uh, whether it's a WhatsApp number or email or whatever, because uh, some of the people here would like dearly love to have one on one sessions with you, be in contact with you in terms of chatting that way for that. So over to you, Doctor. Okay, thank you. I will not publicize it in front of the TV. <laughs> I'll give it to you later on. 
Yes. And then uh, people can simply come through you and give you my contact details. Um, I, I, I think uh, when I was going through the research, um, they did speak a lot about the importance of having sports activities in order to improve people's mental health and to curb uh, mental illness. Um, unfortunately, I mean, uh, we need to have this element uh, whereby there's sports activities happening again in each and every school. They can com compete with each other. And also uh, <coughs> music education as well, or music activities. We all noticed that at some point we were all sort of depressed, and then the speaker had to ask the band to, to you know, to, uh, put up an item for us, and we became happier, isn't it? We became more excited. So there's an importance of music and sports in terms of lifting our spirits and um, contributing to our mental health. Uh, again, the Department of Education should be do, you know, doing a lot more in terms of setting up those uh, sport, sporting activities and uh, buying uh, musical uh, instruments for, for our school kids. And I don't whether the, you know, the question of maintenance and safety of those equipment is another matter, but they should do it. I think that's, that's the most important thing that, that, that I feel we should do. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think my task has now come to an end. I'm going to invite Osborne just to take us through the final part of the program. Or oh, you want me to do it? <laughs> and just to a, a reminder also to our viewers that there are our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and I don't, I think it's Zoom also, that they can continue to ask those questions and then through the questions, we make sure that in one way or another, uh, the good doctor will be able to engage with them and respond. Right. OK. Over to you. Thank you very much. You are saying I got done in five years. Yeah. <laughs> one. Uh, yeah. It's a lot, eh? And I think it's a national, we should have a national depressed. Depression Day. We, I'm sure we go, we, we work, we do all fun stuff and not go to work, you know, and just forget about life itself and just be. Because I will say a cool, I think. And unfortunately, we probably wouldn't afford I'm a therapist to help children. Well, it's another story for another day. The government will provide one day. We pray. I pray. It keeps me grounded. And then I would like to thank the TFC Machine family for being here. And thank you so much that you gave birth to the TFC Machine because we wouldn't be having this conversation if, I know it's not him, but I mean, he's a man in the family, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so thank you so much. We appreciate that we had a gift from Uti Uti. Today we are talking about depression because the organizers, um, Yama Alumni, have actually thought of having the annual memorial Yama Uti So thank you so much. We would like to call you to come and say something um, to the people, if you don't mind. Just a, sh just a short words, short words of encouragement when you come from royalty, and then you can you can you can you can give a, a doctor a gift from the organizing team. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Dean Mashinini. I think I'm going to thank everybody who is here, individually and otherwise. But my keyword is the MC. I think 
there is something very special about her. I think she's special because she, she got through the subject of the day physically, and she got out, and today she's a proud woman. I think that makes her extremely special. Please keep it up and make them follow you. Let them follow you. You see, the danger is that one day you will be in New York and they will ask you, hey, where do you come from? And then you say, I'm from my city, man. <laughs> you see, the, that, that, that makes South Africa have a very difficult problem. Yet it is a problem. And yet we have specialists and we have facilities and so on. But it's becoming a big problem. But we need to contain it in the way that Lux is actually saying it. That we must not be victims of situations and circumstances and so on. So I, I think the fact that you are special uh, tells me that the three or four youth that came upstage here, Utanang, uh, uh, Titi Mashini, they're coming up. <laughs> and then you, my sister, there, there's another fellow that disappeared there. Is he still there? Where is he? I think these four youngsters are, are very special, too. I think they're extremely special. Thank you very much. Um, the keynote speaker, the doctor, You know, we, we all went to school, man. We tried this and that and the other and, and so on and so on. And, and I mean, I can, I, can, I can measure the size of your head is, is, is normal, but there's a lot in it. <laughs> <laughs> there's just too much. I don't know how did you consume that, but how do you also manage to systematically give it away to people to consume and understand? I think uh, our keynote speaker is extremely special. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I love you so much. It's beautiful. I think our comrades are extremely special. Thank you very much. Okay, the Morris Election Alumni, Led by Tate, Omri Mahwale, and the whole team, and all those who are in the class and in the school with Titi Mashinini, we give you all the due respect. I think you are very special. Thank you very much. Uh, the drum band outside that welcomed us in the beginning, I think the music was funky, fascinating, but it was also very special. Thank you very much. Now, the last, I think it's ourselves. The audience is... Uh, I think I want to say special 10 times, special, special, special 10 times because you know, we are so ordinary yet so we are also celebrities, we are business people, we are ordinary society people, we are ladies and gentlemen, uh, adults right here. We are such a mixture of an audience yet we are so special again. Thank you so much. My love, I need to give this to you. I thank you very much. But in special, Gala Matendran, Tendran, 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 Tendran. So that Pelan is a baby, so I am special. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Um, it was quite a roller coaster for a day, but an amazing one. And thank you so much to the organizers of the memorial. We appreciate it. We learned so much today. There are some of the things I was hearing for the first time from a doctor. Um, thank you so much to the young team that came up here.
to talk to us. We understand we'll, we'll, we'll be better. We are working hard. It's difficult sometimes, but please um, understand what is your And um, coming up next, we will call the Prince Balawasi Morris Isaacson for a vote of thanks. Um, can you kindly come? I wish it was my Matita. <laughs> but uh, welcome to the principal. Uh, is, is he here? Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. There's a representative that comes from the Morris Isaacson. Um, COVID. It's, it's bad times. Director, my name is uh, Mr. Shabangwani. I'm not the principal. I'm the deputy principal of the school. The principal is, is, not, is not available today. Program director, director, thank you for running the show so nicely. But I, I think, let me be fair and honest, I cannot start afresh because my work is done already. My work is done already, if, if you can agree with me that uh, I cannot even mention who did that, but my work is already done. <laughs> so to start afresh, you know, I'll be wasting other people's time. But uh, let me just uh, again uh, say something with regard to, to Ntate Magubane and Ntate Ishmael. You know, but they reminded me about uh, something else which is very special to me. Uh, you know, my best artist was the late uh, Jonas Gwangwa. So, you know, he reminded me about the late Jonas Gwangwa. May his, his, his soul rest in peace. Uh, you know what? When uh, I play Jonas Gwangwa, if I'm driving, I'll even maybe lost the way. I always, no, you know what? Uh, music always inspires me in such a way that when I'm driving, I concentrate much on music while driving. I can even pass the ramp of that I'm supposed to, to, to turn off there. So, but otherwise, you reminded me about, I mean, my best artist. Also, Western Coast. I, I had two best, I mean, artists. Western Coast and Jonas Guango. But otherwise, let me thank um, everybody. The dog inspired me a lot also. Uh, you know what, sometimes you might be mentally disturbed or illness or depressed, in one can, mention, can say it. But you are not aware about that. It did happen to me uh, in 2020. I was not aware that um, I was, I had depression. Um, up until I consulted a doctor, you know, let me share just in less than 30 seconds. Uh, I, did, I was not aware that I was not okay. And then I went to the doctor and then the doctor said, no, Mr. Shabangwan, uh, we need depression, Ian. <laughs> you know, sometimes when somebody tell you the truth, I don't have such me. But no, you have to tell me, how do you feel, what is happening? Said, no, you know what? I, I, I don't sleep during the night, even during the day. And can you imagine, I'm dealing with these kids on a day-to-day basis. How? Who's got depression, Jan? I was angry in Kinga when, but no, maybe I was going to say, it's the pass on of my father, but learn to learn Zagele, I say, in six months, and yes, he or learn to you go into the Kanja. Is it? Aulan, meet Aulan. 24-7. I must come to work. During the night, I don't sleep. My body went on and came to die. Not to die, not to die. So let me be honest with you. Um, our situation, we can talk up until tomorrow. Uh, my specialty is practical heat. Uh, you know, 
It's difficult to deal with a child. Very difficult. So you must be strong. Like the doctor said, Uguti, Mele make a show Uguti, every action on to an emergency or something. Umari, umtwa na magai nzoko tu kushuti. There is something in that particular child. But I'm telling you, these kids are very clever to the wrong things. Very, very clever. Some of the parents are even killed while they are, while they are alive. So, I don't want to and pick a cool. But it's fine. Maybe it will be a topic for another day. But let me thank our alumni. Thank you very much. Because year in, year out, you organize this. And then for a success, I thank you very much. And then let me also thank everybody who is here. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are yeah, principal, this is really busy in school. It's very tough, but uh, uh, um, thank you so much to the organizers of the ZET Machine State Lecture, I mean, for Memorial Lecture. Uh, it was amazing, um, and we've learned a lot, thanks to our guest. Thank you to the 1976 team, of students, you look good. I can see what it's, it's all about self-love. Um, everyone looks amazing. Guys, I think the, the younger generation, we should learn from the older ones. They, they are seriously in love with themselves. They look good. I mean, looking at, at them sitting there and looking on the side where I would be sitting, um, there's, a, there's a lot of difference. I do the self-love, let's love each other, let's love ourselves, and thank you so much for coming.